save file. Okay, good evening and welcome to our live session here in Kent somewhere in the <laughs> outback. Uh, here with me I have the lovely Rebecca Schiller. Hello. And I'm really pleased to be here and that I found my way here. Yes, well done. <laughs> Quite a complicated set of instructions but you made it yes I did I, I like the your instructions they were yeah. really good <laughs> so I thought we'll start we've had loads of questions come in and obviously the main reason for us being here is to talk about your book and just conveniently yeah. displayed here in case you didn't know what it looked like and actually I've also got my laptop here just to check that we are actually uh, broadcasting that it, someone can actually see us uh, I, I think I'm getting a few thumbs up, so we hope that's okay. So before we go into the questions, I maybe we should just um, remembering how we met each other. Yes. How? So how? I think it must be um, eight years ago. Yeah. Okay. And I had a probably three or four month old baby. Oh, is that, is that right? Tiny. Wow. And I went on a um, doula preparation course. Yeah run by Kiki Hansard <laughs> um, uh, and um, so yeah I got to spend two days with Kiki yeah. uh, learning about all things birth and feeding and and a lot of talking about our own experiences and, and every now and then I'd go off and get the breast pump yes, out. Yes I remember. <laughs> but was, that was before I was founding my own course yes. of course. But that was through nurturing oh, birth. Yeah. yeah. So eight, yeah. eight years ago. Yeah. Uh, and then we kind of did lots of things for nurturing birth together. No sorry for doula UK together. Yes. And we uh, we, we did the first conference didn't we? The first Do you ever. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it was a it was a lovely conference. Um, yes. But I think I said I was never going to organise a conference ever again. Um, never say never. Yeah. Well, I feel pretty. I feel pretty happy with that one. Um, I, yeah, events organising is not is not my favourite thing. Okay. But it was a, it was an amazing conference we had. Yeah. No, we had some major like we had. Bless her, Sheila Kitzinger. Yeah. Do you remember you got me to try and um, discuss a discount with her? <laughs> That did not go very well. Yes, I may have done. But she was worth every penny. She was. She was pretty. She arrived. She had a feather in her yes. hair. Yes. Yeah. And she did the most amazing kind of um, acting out of of the sort of very um, quite a sort of sensual birth. And we had these really um, young guys yes. filming it. Um, uh, and. There, I kept turning around to look at their faces as she acted that out. That was really good. I think she usually, yeah, she was that character, didn't she? That did quite a few uh, very visual, loud yeah. kind of acting yeah. sessions. Yeah, that was good. Which I found, like, I've read a lot, I think since then I've read a lot more of her writing and yeah. her books and I've just been really amazed by um, the sort of legacy that she's yeah. left about, particularly about the, she's got a book called Freedom and Choice okay. in Childbirth, um, which is, yeah, feel, feels like a manifesto to wow. me. <laughs> so maybe, well, she, did she inspire you to, I mean, you've already written two books. Yes. So then you decided that this is, this is your big kind of main project. Was, is that right? Yeah. And what, what did you want to bring to all these pregnant women? And actually it's not just about pregnancy. The book's divided into, you know, pregnancy, birth, and then afterwards. Yeah. So, um, what was the best bit in here in each of those sections? What, what are you most proud of that you think no other book has? Um, so, I, I was trying to sort of reimagine. I mean, there's a lot that people have written a lot of books yes. about pregnancy and birth yes. and, and, and babies. But usually, those books are either from quite a baby-centric yeah. place. Um or often written by um, a health professional, mm -hmm. so focus very much on the kind of quite clinical side yeah. of things. And then, um, or someone who's got a, a, a bias. So, you know, it's, it's a book about how to have a certain kind of birth. Yes, Or to avoid Absolutely. a certain kind of birth. Yeah. But I felt that there was something missing that really, we talk a lot about woman-centred, mm -hmm. and I feel that's used quite a lot yes. as, a, as a word rather than you know, actually centering things on the woman. I wanted to do that here and think about, you know, from my experience yep. and the doula clients I've yep. worked with and from friends and mm -hmm. family, 
what the experience is as a woman becoming pregnant, all those many different experiences, mm -hmm. and that it doesn't just, you don't just become, um, you know, a, a, a baby carrying no. device. No. You're still a person yes. that has friends and family yeah. and relationships, mm -hmm. and you might work, um, you might have financial issues, yeah. you might, and, and, and the, uh, actually a lot of what, you know, I know I've struggled with, and lots of people I know have struggled with afterwards, mm -hmm. is those enormous changes. Yes. Everything about you has changed. You know, your your time for yourself, mm -hmm. your body, your relationship with your partner, yeah, everything. And that no one really prepares you for that. No, very true. So I wanted to try and do something that absolutely covered, you know, the central information mm -hmm. that you need to know as a, as, as a pregnant woman about yeah. birth, and covered all of that from some a perspective that was really um, non-directive, mm -hmm. really accepting, and really tried to show the diversity, but also build in proper preparation for the kind of huge seismic shifts that were going to happen in your life, yeah. and sort of insist that women spent a bit of time in pregnancy actively thinking about that. Yeah. I think that's why there's a lot of um, sort of activities and exercises in the book, because mm -hmm. it's all very well reading something, but I'm trying to encourage people to spend some time thinking about, okay, well, what, what might this mean for my mm -hmm. partner and I? You know, have we got different styles of parent? Yeah. Will we have different styles of parenting because our parents were really, really different? Yeah. Um, and not do all of that later when you've got a three month old baby and, and you're cross and tired and shouting to each other. Um, that was not a succinct answer, <laughs> but, but it, what we'll learn is answer? that I'm not very good <laughs> at succinct, which is why I, when I originally wrote this, it was 20,000 words longer, <laughs> and I had so to cut 20,000 words out. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pick the book up, because it's, I, when I got my hands on it, it just feels really nice. feels really nice to hold. It's, uh, it's got some really nice il illustrations in there, and I can see that you have spent time to do... Write a book, really, like uh, a doula would maybe support someone. Plus, this I like the section here about your rights, yeah. which you kind of have... Uh, it's another big part yeah. of maybe writing the book yeah. or adding that in because yeah, yeah absolutely that I think you know um, it's not a traditional part of preparation no um, and you know there's some schools of thought that maybe thinking about you know telling women these are your rights yes. is setting up for some kind of antagonism uh -huh. you know that you're expecting there to be a problem and mm -hmm. what I've tried to do here is say you know, don't expect there to be a problem because you have these rights, mm. you know. But also, it's really handy to know this. This is information that I want you all to have just in case. Yes. Hopefully you won't need it, but actually maybe it'll be helpful for your neighbour mm -hmm. and your friend. And actually, it, it's pretty helpful to pass on to our daughters if we have them. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, that, yeah, that's in... And I, I put it quite early in the book because I think it's quite useful to mm -hmm. know about information yeah. you know, through your pregnancy. Um and to know how it yeah how it might apply in birth or afterwards yeah. as well yeah it seems that when you when you read the book you kind of you're navigated through the different uh, things you should think about and then when you actually get to uh, summarize it or take an action you also then refer back to it yeah. which is really handy yeah the last chapter chapter 21 I think oh. uh, <laughs> okay. is where you make your own no guilt pregnancy plan okay so sort of go through it's a bit like those books you um, used to have as a, a child, I don't know if you've read them, where you, what page you turn to next depended on how you answered the question, so it's kind of mystery, like, yeah. do you choose to go through the brown door or go to page 15, yeah. and it's a bit a bit like that, so you know, if you're someone that is you know, feeling particularly anxious, you might want to revisit this section, are you um, thinking about um, uh, having a VBAC, mm -hmm. you might find this page useful, yeah. um, and, and so it tries to sort of personalise which books which part of the book yeah. to read and I also suggest early on that some people might like to read that chapter first because I know I quite like to dive into a book mm -hmm. and sort of eat it up yes. <laughs> really quickly but quite a lot of people read differently yeah. find a lot of new information quite overwhelming particularly mm. if perhaps you've got some anxiety issues so if you start with that chapter you can just you know, go specifically mm. to the places that you need to go to. Yeah. Um, and when we record this, there's going to be an audio book of this, which I've read, and we've tried when we recorded that to do exactly the same thing, to break it into tracks. Okay. And make sure that, um, 
only uh, you know you can you can navigate your way through in the same way as you can um, in the in the book. Yeah. I'm looking slightly distracted because yes. I can hear noises that suggest we, one of my children might be out of bed. That, that wouldn't gonna have be a, a BBC sur- News situation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That wouldn't be a surprise. We have we have some some rabbits in the corner <laughs> who are very quiet at the moment. <laughs> I can hear the ducklings. Oh, yeah, I don't know why the ducklings have got they, so they, loud. The ducklings are very, so if you're hearing a lot of, of background noise, it is because we are, and I have a cat here next to me, which you probably, well, you probably will be able to just see. So a we, one-eyed cat. Yes, we, we are really out in the country, so <laughs> it, it, it is what it is. But I think we, we, we have so many questions, and I know most of the stuff you are talking about in the, in the book and yeah. the questions that have come in. So I'm just wondering if we maybe better start with the questions yeah, now. Yeah, because in. so I'm going to just have a look, and I, I've kind of tried to group them together because they have got probably a similar answer, uh, and some of them are very short, and some of them are a bit longer. The yeah. questions, but the one question that we had in, which is not, it's more about maybe we should change. It's actually, we might end with that one because it's all how you think things will be changing. Okay, let's make uh, that one last. Yes, then. but uh, one of the questions, are, what, the first question here was, what drew you to birth as an area you wanted to work in? Oh, that's a good question. Yes. Um, so I had no interest in childbirth. I actually had very little interest in women's <laughs> rights or feminism, embarrassingly. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember being doing my degree and uh, being asked in a you know, big group, put your hands up if you're a feminist. The only person to put their hand up was the only boy in the room. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, which I'm ashamed ashamed of. Um, but I was doing. I went on maternity leave when I was pregnant with my um, first baby from a, a job at a brilliant human rights NGO, mm-hmm. and it's my dream job. But I got so interested in birth mm-hmm. just through preparing. For my own pregnancy, I was really lucky to be um, in an area where there are some amazing antenatal classes. Okay. Um, and so I, you know, I, I had really good support. I found out about doulas. Yeah. I hired a doula, and, and I went from. I'm a, I'm a doctor's daughter, so I'm definitely yeah. not someone that naturally would think about having a home birth. No. Um, you know, I'm known to be a, a wimp, <laughs> um, and, and actually, I think that's what inspired me to have a home birth because yeah. I quite like the idea of not being anywhere clinical if yeah. I didn't need to be so I just I had a really great experience but then watched quite a few friends who were pregnant at the same time not have such mm-hmm. great experiences and I just suddenly thought I could do that mm-hmm. I could be a doula yeah. I, and I felt vocational about it yeah and through the doula work it, I realized that I was interested in human rights through that and mm-hmm. um, I thought I'd left that behind but if you go to lots of births as you know yeah you do see you see the really great stuff and yeah. what an amazing difference it makes but you also see that sometimes women aren't treated with that respect no. and um, so then the idea I met, I met Elizabeth Plasser, yeah. human rights barrister and she said she was thinking of setting up um, an organisation to house some of the pro bono work she was doing would I be interested in joining okay. in in some way yeah. and I did and somewhere along the way I started writing about it as well yeah. Because I didn't have enough to do. Yeah, <laughs> that's what happens, you know. Give something to a busy person, yeah. they, they get it done. Because it's quite, look, talking about human rights, actually, m- most midwives, um, healthcare professionals, women, people in general, don't think about um, childbirth as having anything to do with human rights. And also, that, why would you say that, oh, yeah, human rights may be in Africa or maybe in Asia or maybe in other parts of the world? But like in the, in England, in the UK, in Europe, yeah. you know, we treat the women yeah. with very good human rights. But actually, it's quite surprisingly that most people don't really know what yeah. human rights in childbirth yeah. are. I think I think it's definitely in the past few years. I feel like there's a lot more interest mm. and engagement in the issue, and um, it's beginning to creep into more sort of mainstream um, education, yes. midwives and doctors, yeah. and into, into policy. Um, because it's a very helpful and strong way yeah. to say, be nice to women. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what, that, that, that's that's what, what it is. is. Treat women nice. Listen yeah. to women. Find out something about them. Treat yeah. them as individuals. And be kind to them. Yeah. And, and, and respect their wishes. Yeah. Um, and 
unfortunately saying that sometimes doesn't always work no um you know but if you say actually as a your nhs trust has a legal obligation yeah um, or is doing something unlawful yes and that can have a bit more oomph. yeah um and um and i think you know why wouldn't we all want to know more about our rights as individuals that's a you know that's powerful yeah um and power balances have been a bit out of whack for women in general and you know particularly in this activity which is just about women absolutely so let's let's find the power yes um, I couldn't agree I'm more. The power. Yes, I think I'm a big, big supporter of birthrights, and you do some wonderful work. And and I think I can say that everyone, if if there's something you want to kind of support and donate to, you should, you know, donate to birthrights because they need that money to be able to support all these women that uh, often find themselves in in situations where they don't really have nowhere else to turn. So yeah. I think that's that's why I find it such a Wonderful Thank you for your support. Kiki is very supportive. And if you want to find out more, birthrights.org.uk or at birthrights.org on Twitter. And there's a whole series of fact sheets on there if you want um, more information about your rights. That um, I mean, it is mainly in the book, but yes. there's some longer, more detailed, and, and slightly more sort of specific situations covered online. There is. I like. I love the website. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's move on. We have another question here. So. I'm having so much guilt and anxiety with my pregnancy. I'm 17 weeks. I feel this because I lost my job in February because of HG. So there's hyperanthus gravidarum. Exactly. So I can never say properly. Neither can I. So that's why I gave <laughs> hand it over to you. So it's it's severe sickness, basically, yeah. un, un, unnatural, not unnatural, but not un, not what's normal. Yeah. Uh, and I was on zero hour contract. I just want to know, as an unemployed unemployed mum to be, what am I entitled to? I found that yesterday, by my own research, that I could get food vouchers, but I wondered if there's any other support on the financial side of things. Is that something you know about? So um, I don't feel equipped to answer that question in in lots of detail. But mm. what I think would be good to point people to is the Maternity Action website. Okay. So if you haven't come across Maternity Action yet, um, mm -hmm. they are a brilliant charity, um, also rights-based, but they okay. focus much more on employment rights, um, also breastfeeding All right. rights. And they've got a wonderful um, series of fact sheets. If you have a question about mm -hmm. maternity leave, maternity allowance, paternity leave, shared parental leave, that everything is on there, every possible situation. Um, and then... I'm sorry, my the, uh, the, the, producer. the producer is just... just We've waiting. had a, a message, uh, someone suggesting uh, an organisation called Pregnancy Sickness Support. Well, Pregnancy Sickness Support would be fantastic for the hyperemesis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that I was coming on to that, but thank you. Um, <laughs> I can't see the question, too. But, um, they, so, maternity action yes. is great on all sort of um, employment-related rights. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, Pregnancy Sickness Support is another amazing okay. charity. They focus specifically on supporting women um, with hyperemesis mm. um, and they have some really great resources on their website um, and they have a helpline so they will be really great for any particular questions and might be able to help with the um, employment Yeah, that's so terrible. It's that's awful. so terrible. And, I mean, because obviously she can't work. And the word guilt mm. is in there. Yes. And, and I can, you know, I, I can you know begin to understand why that emotion would crop up yeah. how quickly we kind of feel guilty yeah. about this ourselves but we know that high premises there's nothing you can no. do to prevent that um it, it's it's a you know really really unfortunate um an awful awful thing um and um but yeah pregnancy sickness support and maternity action give them a call yeah. they will help so hopefully that helps and I, I, I noticed someone says, is someone making a co cocktail in the background? It's the rabbits drinking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry I'm really about sorry about that. I, I, they ran out of their drink now, so maybe they would like a cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I hadn't realised quite how much noise all the animals made until um, it just started. now. Maybe we could just take their water bottle away from them for the next half an hour. Um, just to be clear, they have access to water at all times. Um, I think they probably the, won't yeah, die of thirst if we take that away from them. So um, that's it. 
So sorry, we we have Instagram then, going behind the scenes. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> we have another. The, the other question is kind of the, similar. Do I need to tell my employer that I'm pregnant? Yeah. So by the time you are in the twenty fifth week of your pregnancy, yeah. you um, need to tell your employer that you're pregnant. Okay. Um, if you are an employee, if you're freelance. Um, self-employed of course you don't have to tell your clients if you don't want to yeah it's up okay. to you um, and again in terms of um, so I've laid out some of the most common situations <laughs> my husband aka the producer is trying to quieten the rabbits down and is making quite a lot of noise it's very slick very slick setup um, and keep, it's cocktail hour later and it's it? cocktail hour later um, <laughs> I can't remember what we were talking about now. <laughs> we were talking about when you have to tell your employer. You said that if you're self-employed, yeah. you don't have to. Yeah, but of course, lots of people want to. Exactly. Of course. Um, so, and you might actually also be able to tell. Of course. Yeah. And if you um, if you want to tell your employer much, 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 much earlier. Okay. Particularly, for example, if your job requires um, uh, you need a health and safety yeah. assessment, you need to change your work in some way, or you need, of course, you're entitled to paid time off uh -huh. for your antenatal appointments. Yes. So it can be really helpful to tell your employer. And there's another good organisation called Pregnant Then Screwed, um, oh, which right. is doing a lot of work around raising um, maternity discrimination in the workplace, okay. raising awareness, but also offers um, some um, advice to um to women if they're having trouble so if you do tell your your boss that you're pregnant and yeah. they're not supportive okay they're trying to get you to i don't know commit to exactly how much maternity leave you're going to take which you don't have to do um then pregnant pregnant then screwed can be really helpful with that. that's a good name it's good isn't it yeah, yeah there Brilliant. It is. <laughs> so so that's something to, to check out then yeah. if you are feeling that yeah. you're not being treated right um, also, we had this que question, is it true that I'm not allowed a home birth as it's my first baby? No, it's not true. There we go. That's, I mean, that's Simple the short answer. answer. Yeah. And, and actually, that leads on to the next question we had in, who said, if you had a penny for each time, you heard a pregnant mum say, but they told me I wasn't allowed, how rich would you be? I would be very rich. I would be a very rich but really annoyed oh, no, so, so that, The question is, actually, positive actions can be taken now. What simple and positive actions can be taken now to help us move away from the culture of permission granting in childbirth? So I think um, women having access to information about their rights is important. Yes. I think... Um, I think that should just be standard. Uh -huh. We should all begin to expect that. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of talk about expectations of childbirth and motherhood yes. being a bit out, out of whack. And mm -hmm. I agree with that. You know, if you're focusing on my birth has to be exactly like this. Yes. Or, you know, I'm going to be the perfect mother. Yeah. Those are expectations that we can begin to soften and mm -hmm. let go. But the expectation that we'll be treated with dignity and respect, let's just expect that. Yes. That, that, that make that an expectation. I like that. Um, and I think, you know, some women will find it easier to access that information mm -hmm. um, and to advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's the responsibility of us and the system to make sure that women who won't find it as easy, yes. um, women who will find it difficult to advocate for themselves, have someone to advocate for yes. them. And then I think it can't all be on women. No, you know, we can't. It can't. It can't be down to us. You know, I think the expectation thing is important, but then it's about changing the system. Mm. So, um, if something happens to you or someone speaks to you in a way that isn't okay, yeah. giving feedback, yeah, you know, joining your maternity voices partnership, mm. um, to so that you're actually involved in shaping. You know, they need women's voices and a really diverse range of women's voices needs to be heard. And then, you know, some of the work we're doing at Birthrights um, is is to try and get the national maternity policy yeah. reflecting the human rights framework and to get that embedded in, into the training of midwives um, and doctors. And, and that, that seems to be going well. Good. But we're in a time now where, you know, you know how quick change happens. Yeah. I mean, Ten, and it's like ten years, <laughs> yeah, so, ten years or something for something to yeah. change. Yeah, so I think I, I think it's a keep going. Yes, 
you know, keep going. And and like you said earlier, you know, if you if it's something you feel strongly about and you can give birthright some support mm. in some way, and if it's just letting people know about us, yeah. then that's that's really, you know, I think that's really valuable. Absolutely. Um, thank you. That's a good answer on that one. Um, the, and that kind of also because we were talking there about who who's responsible, who should be. How do we get this information out? And actually, I'm going to try and find the actual question that I had someone saying. Um, this this one here. In your experience, does it often take a previous bad experience to make a woman research her rights and take control of her subsequent birth? Or do you think first-time mothers are getting clued up from the start? I think, um, I mean, I when I was working a lot as a doula, mm -hmm. I was increasingly booked by women having their second babies yes it became my sort of area uh -huh. <laughs> um, I think a lot of doulas find that they have a you know a, often have a particular kind mm -hmm. of, of, of client um, and so I was meeting a lot of women who yes sort of decided they'd go with the flow yeah. first time didn't need, need felt they didn't need to know mm -hmm. very much and then discovered that that hadn't worked very well yes. and that they wanted a lot more support Mm -hmm. the second time they wanted more information mm -hmm. um, and I think also women who've had other things in their lives that other kinds of trauma in their lives yes. um, you know women who've experienced sexual violence mm -hmm. other kinds of trauma they might be more um, keen to have a very sort of specific plan and, yeah. to, and to look up information um, but I, I think sadly it's it's right and I know from friends who I've so when a friend tells me they're pregnant, I yeah. used to send them an email yeah. with all the resources, uh -huh. and a little paragraph on doulas, and, and now obviously I just give them the book yes. um, or direct them to. That's, the that's why you wrote. Yeah. Them, so you just can. Yeah. <laughs> and and so I used to, I've, I've evolved the paragraph on doulas. At yeah. first it was just you know I don't know whether you're interested in doulas, but here's mm -hmm. the website. And then eventually the paragraph has become, um, I'm sick of sending this email to people. Who ignore the bits about doulas, yeah. and then afterwards tell me they really can see now yeah. why that support would have been valuable, and that they're going to have a doula next time. Could you be the person who listens yes. to this bit of the email <laughs> and doesn't regret not doing it? I think it's difficult because until you've had that experience, yes. it's very difficult to imagine what it's like and what you what you would need. Um, and I think that's why I've had a big focus on support in the book. Whoever the support is yeah. from, if it's not from a doula, but who you're going to have around you. Yeah. And having a team, you need you need to have those people. Um, I feel like I've wandered off the question. No, no, it's absolutely right. Meandered. Yeah, but it, it's because I, I find that myself. I have an online antenatal program, and I I know that, and it makes me wonder sometimes whether women actually. So that the information's there. You can have a have it. You can have some of it for free. Then, and what, what I find. I'm not sure if women actually go looking for all that information. I think a lot of women are are like I was when I was having my children, thinking that, you know, I'm pregnant, I go to the doctor, I see a midwife, and then they're going to help me. And when I'm, when I'm in labour, they're going to tell me what I need to do, which probably is what, what happens mm. sometimes. But also, I, I don't think that the system set out to, to provide that support, which you talk about in your book, mm that women need yeah. so that's why we we have this kind of mishmash of understanding of what 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 do i need as a pregnant woman yeah uh, what what should i be thinking about as a pregnant woman uh, and not only just about pregnancy and birth but also afterwards because yeah. we know in terms of breastfeeding for example we know if you have the one person there that's there to support you which is usually your partner because the, they're the ones there in the middle of the night yes. it's really going to be helpful yeah. so and I think in your book you talk about setting that support up. Yeah. So at the end there, where you you pull everything together, it's kind of list. You know, do you have these things in place? Yeah. You. I want people to have a little black book of yes. contacts. You know. So, you know, we, you talked about breastfeeding. So, um, you know, if you're if you're planning to to breastfeed, then having who are you going to call exactly. when you need help? Yeah. Don't be looking for it at three a.m. No. When you've got the baby, just look up. The support groups mm -hmm. in advance find out you know what days there's usually a support group every day of the week yeah. somewhere you know mm -hmm. nearest you find out where they are write them down and that makes it as easy as possible for you to get to get that you know get that support in place yeah. when, when you need it exactly but i think uh, one of the things we were saying earlier is that you know 
there is a bit which can about like changing the culture and the yes. feeling that women are quite passive yes in the experience of pregnancy and birth mm. sometimes you know it, it, that we need they need to be rescued yes um and and but they're um, failing bodies yeah yeah <laughs> and and of course women do absolutely need support and 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 they need clinical support yes. from experts like midwives absolutely. and doctors but midwives and doctors most often don't know that woman no um hopefully you know over the next few years there should be more women seeing midwives that they know but even still no one knows how somebody feels and thinks and what's the important mm. to them better than themselves so i think again it's about that those expectations that you have something to offer to this you, you you're not just the person carrying the baby and everyone else has mm. you you have a lot of expertise about yes, your life of course and how your body feels and that expertise is really valuable in terms of safety mm -hmm. reporting any changes and also in terms of working out what kind of birth what what kind of um, support you'll need um, how you want to feed your baby mm -hmm. what stresses you out what you know all those things no one else knows that no so um yeah encouraging women to to bring bring that expertise and to do some preparation based on that that stuff that only they they yes. know absolutely yeah thank you yeah so we also had the question then when talking about this preparation and looking for support someone asks uh, also what do you think of the nct do you think they have an agenda <laughs> i feel like this is a question a question that could get me into from, trouble this is, let's come from someone <laughs> in the nct um so i um, i didn't do nct classes myself so the, the person that we did our classes with um had used to be an nct teacher okay um and i've spoken to people who've had a wide range of experiences mm -hmm. with the nct um, I was talking to um, Karen Hall, who mm -hmm. um, does Sprogcast, yeah. um, about her uh, NCT classes that she runs, which sound completely amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I know a couple of other people who run antenatal classes for the NCT, and mm -hmm. they sound brilliant. Um, and you know, I have we've done a little bit of work with the NCT at Birthrights, and um, you know, they've been they've been campaigning around these issues for mm -hmm. a long time. Absolutely. I mean, the NCT did start with an agenda deliberately. Yeah. You know, they they were the the, the natural childbirth mm -hmm. trust originally, um, and for for a really good reason at the time. Um, you know, they and organisations like AIMS, who set up as the National Society for the Protection of Pregnant Women. Um, <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, uh, and um, or the prevention of cruelty to pregnant women. Oh. It's one of the two, one of the two. Um, you know, we're we're protesting against yes. some quite barbaric mm -hmm. medicalized treatment of, of women. Um, and so the idea of natural childbirth as empowerment made made sense in that context. And of course, now we're in a very different place. Yes. The NCT has still got some of those connotations for some mm -hmm. people, maybe even some people within it. Um, but you know, it's certainly been a, a huge force for for change and Absolutely. for good in 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 birth. Um, and um, I think people's experience of the classes probably depend on the teachers. The one the one thing that I do think about antenatal classes is that really difficult to it, everyone's busy, yeah. and it's really attractive to go to a kind of weekend. Yeah. Let's cram it in in a weekend. Yeah. And I was really lucky that the, the classes we went to, Jessica James in Hackney, she makes you, you have to do the whole thing. You have All to right. go to antenatal yoga every week okay. from 20 weeks to wow. your pregnancy. Then do your couples classes every week for six weeks and then do a postnatal group every yeah. week. And you have to do it all. And it's fantastic because you have this little pocket of time to do yoga and yeah. think and build a connection with women and um, make this amazing group of friends and then you've still got the postnatal group to yeah. support you and that there's a real value in that but I think gets lost when you try and cram a, a, a course into a into a weekend yeah. and that's not that not that the NCT do offer longer classes as well and, and you know lots of other people do mm. weekend classes but I think it is a, a trend to try and do it as quickly as possible yes. and I'm not sure that, um, that that's the the best way for a lot of people no because one of the things you say like i'm just looking at the chapters of your book and and each one has your mind you know like we, we think about preparing for birth it's all kind of just so we know what happens that's mm. kind of all we need to do 
But when you're talking there about having to commit to a longer period of time, when you actually invest in thinking about it, because mm. as doulas, we know that birth is in your mind, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I like the idea of, you know, over time having to change your... Yeah. It, it's not... And, and, because it's not a academic thing, really, to give birth. No, you don't. You know, you need to shut that part of your brain down. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, I think it, yeah, I, I I think that. But it's difficult. It's difficult for people to find the time to do that. And again, it's one of those things. If you haven't done it before, yeah, you don't know that that's valuable. That's what I'm you thinking. It's all right, pain having to. You yes, know, I'm sure. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd booked in on a weekend <laughs> <laughs> alternator. You were thinking. No, so absolutely. But the NCTS are still the the biggest kind of um, providers for yeah. antenatal education. Yeah. But still, overall, in the UK, there's the majority of women don't actually do any antenatal yeah. preparation. So that, that's something that could be changing. Um, okay, so uh, how can I gain the courage to try for a fourth child after suffering severely from HG, which is the hyperemesis, yeah. uh, with all my pregnancies? I mean, that's such a personal... Yes. That's such a personal decision. I mean, I know from following pregnancy sickness support mm -hmm. and there's a, a brilliant um i can't remember the name there's a, a, if i could find it i'll come back and tag it somewhere Post, on instagram yeah. who's documenting her pregnancy journey okay with hg and you know i can well understand from well, i can't understand but i can begin to it's 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 mind-boggling to think how you would make that decision yes, again I agree. um and I suppose it, it's about making sure that you can get access to mm -hmm. the right kinds of treatment. I know yes. that's an issue for some mm -hmm. women who um, suffer from the condition that their, their doctors aren't aware of mm -hmm. what they can and can't, can't take. Um, Pregnancy Sickness Support's got lots of really good information on that. Um, and, and so, yeah, are you going to be able to get the right treatment? And what kind of support do you need around you? How are you going to manage with your other children? Yeah. Um, and I suppose only, only the person that was courageous enough to do it the second yes. time and the third time exactly. can decide whether they're courageous Just enough to, to do, do it the fourth time. Absolutely, good answer. So, uh, do you have to have a sweep for labour to start? No. That's another one of those, <laughs> like, do you, do you have to? So, basically... No. No. Labour starts when labour starts. There is some evidence that a sweep can um, decrease the chances of women needing to have an induction of labour. Okay. So there, there is some evidence base that a sweep can tip women into labour, but yeah. also some women find it particularly unpleasant and find it starts off, you know, those kind of yeah. stoppy starty crampiness. Yes. So you don't have to have a sweep, you can decline one um, and if you want one, it, I mean, it may or may not work, yeah. but, but there is some evidence to suggest that they might, they might work. Yeah. But then it, you don't have to have an induction either? Absolutely not. No. No. So you can just <laughs> wait forever and hope that you will going to labour. Which actually, that's very true, it's yeah. not that, who knows yeah. how long everyone's pregnancy is. Okay, so um, how do, uh, this is one about um, healthcare professionals. How can healthcare professionals help open the dialogue on birth trauma and the support available? I think it's really important for... Um, women who've had a traumatic birth mm -hmm. to know where to get help yeah um and uh, there's there's often not a lot of local knowledge about what services mm -hmm. there and um, there's a wonderful um uh friend um and sort of colleague that i know emma svanberg mm -hmm. who's started um a brilliant website called make birth better mm -hmm. and on there she's got a map of all of the services she's found and that deal with birth trauma all around the country and you Excellent. can add if you find a service and mm -hmm. it's not on there you can add it onto the okay. map so i think if 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 healthcare professionals just make sure they know their patch mm -hmm. um and then and there's some work um rebecca moore um dr rebecca moore has been uh, putting together brilliant birth trauma conferences um with really great um speakers talking about the latest research into birth trauma what actually helps you know mm -hmm. debriefing Actually, might not be the right thing, no. um, and techniques like rewind mm -hmm. and the eye movement, desensitisation therapy. So yeah. know know about it, find yes. out about it, and have information and resources you can pass on when women ask. And and I think that other thing of not not being 
dismissive mm. of people's trauma, you know, and, and definitely never saying the, oh, well, you know. All that you've matters. Got, you've got you and your baby are, yeah. are healthy, which is, of course, supremely yes. important and, and um, devastating if that isn't the outcome. Yeah. But it, it doesn't mean that everything that happened on the way there was okay. No. So, um, no, I think that's a real important thing for that, that we learn uh, as doulas, the whole validating what women are feeling and listening to them, yes, which makes yeah. a huge difference. Yeah. Um, and that's also during the birth, which can then prevent trauma, yeah. even, to have, have yeah. a doula there. I remember doing a, a talk, I can't remember, I think it might have been to, to, to midwives, and quite a lot of my slides were just a giant ear. Okay. <laughs> it's just a picture of a giant ear. Like, what's yes. the most important thing? Yeah. Your ear. Yeah. You know, listen, listen to women. Yeah. And, and, and that I, I imagine that must get really difficult the more births you do. I'm sure many healthcare professionals, such as midwives, have trauma themselves, or post traumatic stress from things they have seen and just yeah. and being able own, to. Often yeah. their own births yeah. and experiences. We all bring our stuff, don't of we? Of course. But you helped me debrief it, Kiki. Yes. When <laughs> Everyone should be. I like to call it a birth completion. Oh, birth nice. completion session. Yeah. A debrief sounds like you've been in a mission somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of check. Can sometimes feel like a mission, though. Yeah, I know, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so, uh, does your book touch on mental health needs of mothers, such as antenatal and postnatal depression, anxiety, and psychosis? Yes, yes, mm. yes, and yes. Um, is the answer. <laughs> it's very, I think that's very important. I think that what I find or have, have found is that women often don't want to talk about things they don't want to happen. Mm. So let's not talk about it. But if you don't talk about these things, then they, uh, it becomes difficult if yeah. you, they happen to you. Yeah. We know there's a lot of stigma around yes, mental health. Um, and so I just think it's important to have the information on how common it is to mm -hmm. have mood changes yeah. and how common it is for, for women to experience some kind of mental illness during pregnancy or, or afterwards um, and, and how to look out for signs of yeah. that, how to know what's kind of in the normal mm -hmm. range of, you know, I've just had a baby and I'm really tired and, yeah. you know... I'm and cry a lot. Cry a yeah. lot, <laughs> which, you know, I'm, I remember ringing um, another doula friend, Mars, who um, on... Day four, when I'd had my second baby, and I can't do it, I can't feed him, my husband's terrible, and everything's going wrong. Um, and she was, she listened, she was lovely, and yeah. she didn't say to me, You've forgotten it's day four. <laughs> you have just crying because it's, you know, the, the, the horm the classic yes. hormone crash when your milk comes in. Yeah. Um, but, 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 you know, talking about some of the rarer things, mm. it, you know, it, uh, postnatal um, psychosis. Yes. Um, I think it's just important that information, most women will just skip right over that. Yeah. But you've got it to go back to. And the same with other difficult things, you know, I've, I've made sure to put information about miscarriage, mm. information about what happens if a baby dies. Mm. Um, and those are very difficult things to put in a book. But for most people are going to have just the most wonderful, you know, experience yeah. and, and have a, a, a healthy and happy baby at, at the end. But even if you skip through those bits, yeah. you know they're, they're there. And you, if you need to then know to get some support or if you've got a friend, you know, you, you'll be able to, to, to point them to sources of support mm. because you've, you, you've got some information. So we don't tell women a lot of things because we don't want to upset them and scare yes. them. And I think we're all, you know, we're all big enough yeah. to, to, you know, have that information. And, and we know from studies such as the birthplace study that childbirth overall, if you have a healthy pregnancy, is some, I think it's 99.57% safe. Yeah. It's, it's so it's your, it's very <laughs> unlikely for things to go wrong if you have a healthy pregnancy. Yeah. Which Giving which, birth in this country, in England, is, is very, it's yes. one thing birth said, it's very, it's very safe. You know? Absolutely. Um, but, but, you know, I think it's, it's important to have, um, have the, those, all those ranges. Of yeah, I, I agree, yeah. totally. Uh, so, what is the most important factor to reduce birth trauma in this country? That's a tricky one. Uh, it's a really tricky one. I mean, uh, honestly, I think money. Yeah. I, th I think if, if we had better funded maternity services. Yeah. Um, and Everyone had a doula. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, you know, staff, if the staff 
um, were valued. Yes. They're treated well. You know that that has a big impact um, on you know midwives who've been working a, a, a thirteen hour shift and haven't yeah. had time to go to the loo. That's yeah, madness. Um, so investing money in our yeah. maternity services and valuing the people within those, the midwives and doctors who work incredibly hard, yeah. I think is, is hugely important. That noise is the cat scratching at the door, just so you know. Um, <laughs> in a minute Instagram there's going to be a, a lion <laughs> coming. A lion walking and the, in. The, the, the sheep will run through the house, which they did the other day. Yeah, No, it, absolutely. I think there's a lot of improvements that, yeah, like you say, money. When yeah. it comes down to it, more money in maternity services, yeah. which we are seem to be seeing a decline rather than an increase, yeah. and more and more women are having babies in the, in the UK. You know, but I think practically for women, um, I think that knowing something like the Brain acronym, which is yes. in the book, a decision making tool, and having practiced that with your partner is really important. So, there's research that shows that in the things that are most likely to make birth traumatic mm. are um, not feeling listened to. Yeah. Feeling obviously you need you, you know you feel that there's something going wrong. There's some yeah. kind of danger. But even if you're having a difficult birth, um, if you're treated with kindness, yes. you're listened to, and you feel some kind of sense of control, mm. that can help mitigate the trauma. Yeah. And so, um, I think making sure you've got a support person. Yeah. You know. Possibly in addition to your partner, yeah. you know, that's one of the reasons to have a doula, someone who's unflappable, seen it, done it. That was actually one of the questions. Oh, was it? What, what, what is the point of a doula if you have a partner? Wow, oh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I've been hired, I bet you have two for the partner. Yes. Loads of yeah. times. Women who think, I'm going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> that, you know, that guy or my girlfriend, she's, you know, she's yeah. not going to be able to handle it. Um, and, and. And that's, uh, you know, we're there for everybody, there for the whole yes. family. Um, I think it's a lot to put on a partner who's never been to a birth yeah. before um, and who's incredibly emotionally invested yeah. to be the only person to, to look after your mm. emotional and kind of physical support needs during what could be hours and hours and hours and hours. Yeah. Um, and... So having another pair of hands mm -hmm. is a really helpful idea, whether it's a pair of hands to be the person who's doing the practical stuff. Mm. Um, you know, I, you all have done this work. You become the birth pool filling, yeah. tea making, bag carrying, or finding things, taxi in the bag. calling, yeah, yeah. finding <laughs> person, yeah. or you become the breathing with yes. someone through their mm -hmm. contractions, um, helping them change positions, mm -hmm. person. Or sometimes you, you 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 know you swap those round, yeah. but you find the gap. Mm -hmm. um, and I think partners really value the support. Yes, I think it. I really think it frees them up to get involved as much as they want, yeah. or as little as they want. <laughs> and now the rabbits <laughs> found something else. The bag oh again. my goodness! So, it's that's like so a happy. zoo in here. No, so I, I think it's I think it's always a valid um, thing to have have a doula um, yeah. with you to. If you want one, you can also, we have an access fund, or Doula UK has an access fund, where you can have um, the support of a doula. I don't know how much there is in that access fund at the moment, because we're looking into turning it into a charity, so yeah. that everyone that wants a doula can have a doula. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, particularly for, for, for women who, who, you know, might need that extra bit of support, having, mm -hmm. you know, particularly complicated lives around, you know, that's, that, you know, the access fund can be... Yes invaluable i think the other thing to say about doula support is there was um, uh, a a cochrane review of con continuous support during labor and it found that if you have the continuous support of mm -hmm. someone during labor it, it makes your labor quicker yeah. you're more satisfied with the experience you have less intervention mm -hmm. and even baby's apgar scores were yeah. higher and the the kind of supporter that had the most dramatically better results mm. was someone who wasn't a member of the staff, the hospital wasn't a friend or family mm. member and was experienced in some way in birth so yeah. a, a, a doula so science says it's good science too. says it's a good idea <laughs> and I think and it must be true <laughs> I sometimes I'm reticent to say that because yes. I want you to think you know it's a, have a doula because you want to avoid no. intervention no. you know but but knowing that it has an impact 
it's you know it's yeah. not it's not I I think it's often seen as a sort of luxury yeah why would you bother with yeah. that or a new trend or something yeah but it's not it's not yeah women have been having other women who yeah. know a thing or two around exactly. them for, for years but we often just don't have that anymore no. do we we lost the village we lost the village yeah. so you know sometimes you've got to you've got to bring the village in mm -hmm. you know Absolutely. Call, so, call your village. We have it. We, we have to keep cracking through these Am questions. I, I no, know. no, it's very good. I'm with you. Uh, uh, question for uh, what is the main thing in your opinion that midwives should do to support women to feel less guilty during pregnancy? Um, I think you know, guilt often comes about when you feel like you're doing the wrong thing yes. or something is your fault, um, and and that's not. Uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of women are, are not doing anything like that in their pregnancies. So, as a as a midwife, if you can give women space to talk, mm -hmm. I know it's difficult in the amount of time you've got in appointments, but also try to avoid that sort of directive language mm -hmm. um, or anything that could could feel like a you know could feel like a judgment or a criticism. Yes. Um, and if you know, again, thinking carefully about the kind of language that you use, not not choosing words like not allowed mm -hmm. and using positive words so if you if you examine somebody and they perhaps aren't quite quite as dilated as you thought they yes. might be and they thought they might be yeah being sensitive I, w I watched one born every minute and a midwife did the most wonderful job yeah of telling somebody they hadn't dilated at all and making it sound like they were just oh, winning <laughs> yes <laughs> and, and, and and i think you know that that being honest but yeah. not saying well your cervix has failed to open yeah. or you're only two centimeters yes. but saying well you know you've done a huge amount of thinning out that's often quite a lot of the work do you yeah. just see it's you know starting to open you've got this really good contraction you know having having a positive spin rather than a negative spin um and language language plays a huge part yeah. in that how we what words we use all the time and i think that's starting to change we saw that kind of published in, in the papers yeah. the new languages we're going to be yeah. used the new language and hopefully everyone will it's just a new thing it always takes a while like you said change yeah. takes a while yeah. to happen so um this was another question that came in my biggest regret after having my son is not sticking to my guns about not having visitors for the initial period pressure from family in-laws who didn't class themselves as visitors <laughs> even though i did what are your thoughts on a post-birth plan and how to manage people in the early days and get dad on the side as well? Yeah. I mean, I think the kind of postnatal plan is the one that everybody needs to yes. make the most. Yeah. Um, and um, so one of the things I talk about is in uh, as early on as you can to have the conversation about visitors. Yes. And there's an exercise in here which I refer back to a lot is the calm and stress triggers exercise. You just work out what calms you down and makes yeah. you feel good and the things that drive you insane. Yeah. Um, particularly for visitors who apply on the who appear on the stress triggers list. Yes. You know, you need to think about how you're going to manage that. And I yeah. think it's about having that open dialogue with your with your partner. Mm -hmm. What you know, having that conversation where you, you feel able to say, I cannot mm -hmm. have your mother mm -hmm. anywhere near me for the first week. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do to manage her expectations? Yes. Um, but, but essentially, it's, it is up to you. This yeah. is really, really yes, important it's, time. It is. Um, and we were really lucky with visitors both times. We've had lovely visitors who came at the right time, mm -hmm. stayed for the right amount of time, brought food. Yeah. If you're visiting a pregnant woman, a woman who's just Bring had a baby, food. take food, mm -hmm. um, clean up a bit for her, yeah. make her a cup of tea, and then leave. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Then go. She doesn't want to chat for long. Tell her how great she is, yeah. how beautiful her baby is, that you like the name, and then just go. <laughs> the, be the best advice. <laughs> Absolutely. It's very Don't true. Don't take her any flowers. Yeah, because uh, you already have too many. <laughs> and I think that that plays into that whole idea that we we want to be nice women. We don't want to say no. We don't want to yeah. put ourselves first. We're like, but it's okay. It's you know, I think it's really important to become a bit selfish. Um, well, not being selfish, but think about putting yourself first because it's a lot to go through. Yeah. Um, and yeah, most of us have heard you know, or remember even that day when everyone came around and you end up in your bedroom with your baby yeah. asking your partner to tell everyone to leave. Yeah. 
So don't get in that situation. No, plan it I beforehand. I think that's it. Plan it beforehand. Yeah. Be okay with saying no to people. Yeah. Um, think about what you can give them. You know, could they come for a bit longer, a bit later? Yeah. You know, whatever it is. And the same with birth. You know, you, you do not have people at your birth that you do not want to be there. No. Th- don't say yes to your mother-in-law or your mother or no. your sister or your best friend if you think that they will drive you mad and be on their phone or be reliving their own yeah. birth experiences. And, it, and even if you have a healthcare uh, professional there that you don't feel that you're gelling with, you could also ask for uh, another one, you know, like if there is the op- option yeah. to have another midwife or another. You, you might not actually, they don't have to provide it, do they, the hospital, but... Well, no, I mean, I think if, you know, especially if they're very, very short staff, Then um, you can't really do but, much. But if, if, yeah, if there's, if you're having a real clash with somebody, then yeah. it's very reasonable to ask mm. if you can, if you can have somebody else. Clash of personalities. Yeah. yeah. We also had this question quite late. Uh, currently 24 weeks pregnant and while, sorry, we'll be going for an elective ces- cesarean section after an extremely traumatic birth first time around. How should I respond to scepticism about this decision from certain health professionals? One midwife spoke to recently literally said I would be a shame it would be a shame for me to pursue this path, which devastated me and took me by surprise. It took me days to bounce back from. I know 100% it's the most positive choice for us, but until I get the green light, I'm a massive ball of anxiety. And well meaning but misplaced comments like this are making me feel even worse. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, it's a story that I feel quite familiar with. Uh-huh. Birthrights has been doing a lot of work around um, maternal requests, uh-huh. cesareans that yes. aren't for particular medical medical reasons. And um, I think it, it's a it's been a difficult situation for women because unlike with with some things that you could say well i insist mm-hmm. it, it it's been it's been harder to insist on on having a cesarean the the best practice guidelines say that a particular obstetrician is allowed to decline okay. um, um, a, a cesarean for, for non-medical reasons um and and that that's reasonable um, okay. do, do, doctors will have different sort of ethical thoughts and it is surgery and, mm-hmm. and they can feel that they're performing harm yeah but that then you should be referred okay. to another obstetrician who will agree to perform the surgery unfortunately some nhs trusts have just done a blanket ban on, okay. on those kind of cesareans so if if um the person who wrote in the question yes. is having problems getting the cesarean signed off then she needs to go onto the birth rights website. We've mm-hmm. got lots of information about exactly how to request okay. um, a cesarean. And then if she's still having problems, our free advice service mm-hmm. can help to, um, we, we can always intervene mm-hmm. and write to the trust. Um, in terms of other people's opinions, yes. I mean, you can, you can give birth in any way. Yeah. And there will be a whole range of people who think you are doing it wrong. Yeah. So... I've been called a zealot for talking about home birth. I'm so not zealoty, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm not a zealot. I don't think anyone should have a home birth if they don't, you know. I'm not trying no. to persuade anyone, but and, and that I was being dangerous, yeah. and, you know. And and you can find that on all yeah. ends of the spectrum. People get very defensive about their own choices. Yes. Um, midwives who will, you know, will have seen women struggle recovering from a cesarean. I can, I can see that maybe there was a good place that was coming from, but such an inappropriate comment. Mm-hmm. What really struck me in that question though is she says she's a hundred percent sure this yes. is the right choice. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, then it may be a case of letting some of those other people's comments bounce off mm-hmm. you as much as possible. It's yeah. difficult. There's a, um, an anxiety, um, focused exercise in the book for if you're, if you're a sort of mindfulness exercise yeah. that can help refocus if you're having feelings of anxiety um, and then you know getting that plan in place as early as possible mm-hmm. so that your cesarean is booked in you don't have to have those conversations yeah. and of course if someone is waxing you know lyrical about certain ways of giving birth or saying that your choices aren't right you don't have to listen to no. them you can also say oh the cat really wants to 
get in the action. Really? Yeah. Um, you know, you can just say, I've, you know, I've already agreed it with, um, you know, with the doctor. Yeah. Um, and I don't wish to discuss it. Yeah. Anymore. I like that. Absolutely. I am done. I am done. Um, this is my choice, my yeah. option. Yeah. Um, and that's so important. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I know it's already nine o'clock. I actually gone just nine. But we still didn't answer that first question, which okay. we skipped. Okay. So let's finish with that. I know there's a couple of questions here I haven't asked, but we don't want to go on all night. <laughs> Who knows what animal? Yeah, I don't know what animal's going to come next. So, how would you like to see um, the treatment? Well, I must must be of women in childbirth change in the next ten years. So, how should practice evolve? I think I'd like to see us move from um, the way we talk about birth, the way we think about birth, and the way that that policy is written around birth tends to be. As if there are sort of lots of different separate and competing ways of giving birth, yeah. and that some of them are better than others. Yeah. Um, and and that women go through a system that feels a bit like a, a factory. Yeah. So if what we can do instead of having a sort of industrialized system full of rights and wrongs, yeah. we genuinely focus on the woman. Yeah. Um, focus on caring for her, mm -hmm. looking after her, um, and working out what she needs, helping her to work out what she needs, and then doing it. Yeah. Whatever it is. Um, and I think if everywhere in the country, women had access to the different kind of birth settings, mm -hmm. you know, this should be coming through. Yeah. Um, then that would make a huge difference. And then thinking about what what success looks like yeah what success looks like for a woman yeah success to me isn't about having everything go go to plan no it's about how you were supported to cope and be resilient yeah and have some wonderful things and there will be some not wonderful things that were going to happen yeah um so let's change the whole way that we talk about it yeah. you know I, I wanted to call this a revolutionary guide because I want like uh, because of the word revolution yeah. you know I think we need to change the way we talk about, talk about women talk about birth a lot of that is in systems and services but actually it's in the media it's in the way we talk mm -hmm. to each other you know being tolerant of other people's choices yes not thinking that because someone had a cesarean it means they think my home birth was bad no and vice versa yeah, exactly. and if you gave birth a certain way and you face judgment for it do not turn around and deal out that judgment to someone else. Mm. You know, we have to take responsibility for our own place in yeah. a system that encourages us to, to to judge each other and make each other feel rubbish yeah. about our choices. It's imaginary. There aren't two. You know, there isn't a natural birth and a medicalized birth. No. We're all somewhere on the spectrum. Yeah. You know, there isn't a, a, a fantastic birth or or a terrible birth. There's we're all somewhere on that spectrum. Mm. So just refusing to engage with that. Yeah, you know, I, I like think that. let's just not let's just let's just listen to women. Let's just listen to each other, and and focus that support um, on making what the individual wants happen, and then making our rabbits be quiet. <laughs> the next most important thing that was, <laughs> that was really good that was that was wonderful and before we finish thank you so much rebecca oh, thank you, and Katie. to your lovely husband jared for being the producer director and cameraman and animal uh, carer <laughs> uh, so the book is out um, thursday yeah, third of may yeah and you can pre-order it anyway from Amazon. Yeah, you can pre-order it. There is also a Kindle version. Oh, wow. And an audiobook version. And I am just going to plug the audiobook by saying that all the exercises, all the breathing exercises and things that are in the book, I read them out in full. Ooh. A separate track so you can use them in Perfect. labor, you can use them for relaxation. Um, so that it's quite a good, if you've, if you've got one of those audible subscriptions, um, it's quite a good one to, you know, to have as a companion to the book. There you go. So, yeah. E excellent. And uh, I was, what was I going to say? There was something else, but now it's gone right out of my head. Oh. Um, was it about, was it about birth bliss? No. No? <laughs> no, no it wasn't. <laughs> no, it was something about the book. 
but it, it but just go and get it uh, and it, it's it's a lovely lovely feel yeah. even to hold it so that's it from Kent this yeah. evening and thank you everyone for joining us and I hope that was helpful and I look forward to seeing you with my next guest who I haven't decided yet but <laughs> I will let you know <laughs> so good night from Bye. us bye bye thank you